Yeah, good evening, everybody, and welcome to yet another MNR, Wednesday MNR, which is Thursday if you're uh, in uh, Asia, Australasia. Um, we have a wonderful talk today that will be given to us by Stefan Thiel on Auslamp. Um, but before we introduce Stefan, let me just remind you of the upcoming MNRs. Next week, we have Alison Kirkby, also an Aussie, giving us a, a talk on software, MTPI. Uh, and then the week after that, we have Doug Oldenburg on fundamentals of inversion. That's surely going to be very uh, popular. I notice the times of these. Uh, Alison Kirkby will be at uh, 2100 UT, so two hours before now, and then Doug a bit earlier. Week after that, we have uh, Lindsay Hickey, who's been working with Doug for a long time. Um, who's going to talk about capturing Doug's brain in code, so to speak. Uh, and then we have Constanza Manasero, who's going to introduce us to a fabulous new way of getting very fast approximate 3D solutions for a probabilistic inversion. And then uh, Juliana Hubert will talk about space weather GICs, MIT. And in early April, we've got NASA Megbell on ModiM. It, it, it's probably what it is, the most used uh, 3D inversion code in the world right now. Uh, and Randy Mackey follows a couple of weeks later on geologically consistent inversion of geophysical data. So a wonderful lineup. We've got more speakers, but uh, still to set up those. Um, just to remind you that all these talks are, are available for registration and for viewing of prior talks on the MNR webpage. And you are on a Zoom webinar. For those of you not familiar with Zoom webinars, you've got the functionality that you have. You can uh, set your audio settings. You can uh, send a message to the panelists through the chat box. You can raise your hand if you want to speak towards the end, of course. Uh, or you can send a, a question to the presenter to answer, which he might answer on the fly or at the end of the webinar. Okay, with, with, without uh, more ado then, let me introduce uh, Stefan Thiel, who will be speaking on Auslamp, illuminating Australia's lithosphere. And, and Stefan has sent a CV, which you've all read, you will have seen when you, when you were registered for the, uh, the webinar. I just say he's a principal geophysicist at uh, Geological Survey South Australia. And um, as you can read, he's, he's done a, an awful lot of work. Um, okay, I won't take up more time. So, um, Stefan, if you want to start sharing and take over. Yep, thanks, Alan. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, let me just quickly do the sharing of screens. Um, whoops. I'm hoping that everyone can see that. Alan, can you just confirm? Yep, no problem, yep. Stefan, that's great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I'm really just seeing this as a, that I'm speaking here on the behalf of all of Australia's um, MT community. And there could be a, um, a number of people who have given this talk. So, but it, it's really quite exciting just to be able to share you know, how OSLAMP has progressed over the years and um, how much it has grown and really some of the very stunning results that has come out of it. So it's, it's a really exciting project to be involved with. Um, I just want to start with some acknowledgements. I will finish with some, uh, learning, uh, you know, talking about some people as well, but this is a multi-institutional effort um, between state geological surveys, universities um, that are working very collaboratively, uh, collaboratively on this project. Um, and it's it's really a national initiative um, of you know unprecedented scale, definitely when it comes to MT, and uh, it's it's very exciting. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and background, really kind of the steps that you know MT, uh, you know we as a community had to go through um, before Oslo really started in Australia. I'm going to talk about some of uh, the Oslo array and you know really how we're doing it in Australia. Um, itself and then I'll just run through some research highlights um, you know from various groups and some of the outputs that have come out of um, Oslem for mineral systems 
uh, research, but also, you know, tectonics, etc. So it's been a really a very exciting project. So before I start with Oslim, so, you know, I, I kind of looking back at, you know, what has actually been done in Australia when it comes to array type uh, measurements. And I had to go back a long, long way to, um, you know, this publication from 1962 by Parkinson. He was a lecturer in the 80s, um, uh, then in Tasmania. And, you know, he really started out with, you know, what is now really well known as the Parkinson vectors. So all these arrows here are basically the ratios of vertical to horizontal magnetic fields. And, you know, this is really how geomagnetism started. And, you know, they're all pointing towards the oceans because that's where the conductors are. And, you know, there's always this ongoing <laughs> feud between the Parkinson convention that, you know, and the Wiese convention, which is originated originally from Germany. And, you know, some of you have been to the EM workshops, know these very famous soccer matches when I've had my first EM workshop 15 years ago. Um, you know, a soccer match between Germans and the rest of the world to decide, you know, which part, which convention we're going to use. The Parkinson Convention one, but there's still some hard, hard one. Um, you know, defendants of the Visa Convention. So that, you know, this is really how it started. And then over the years, um, this expanded into a grid called the AVEX array across all of Australia. And you got a first glimpse of you know, what is really going on geomagnetically across um, Australia itself. So these are the arrows, again, they're pointing towards conductors. And just from looking at them, obviously, the ocean has a strong effect. Um, but people started to realize also locations of really large scale, continental scale type um, conductors that are sitting somewhere in across the mantle. Um, the depth constraint was very poor. And some progress has been made um, over the years by inverting this data um, you know, using thin sheet modeling, uh, where the assumption is that the Earth is 1D except for uh, 3D sort of top layer. So this is one way to kind of start to highlight where some of the conductors are. And again, they're coming out nicely, you know, what was interpreted before. And this then led to an actual uh, rigorous inversion of uh, GDS data. So this is again, the tip are just the ratios of horizontal to vertical magnetic fields. And this is some of the results that Li Zhong Wang published um, just about seven years ago um, across Australia. Again, this is only constrained by the magnetic field, so there are limitations to the results. And the first really um, 3D inversion of long period MT data in Australia was done um, by our group back at the University of Adelaide, where we had an array of you know, a few stations here, um, semi-regular grid of 100 kilometers. There were some profile lines that we included and really the main outcomes there, just because of the station spacing that was available, um, is really a good highlight of what was going on in the mantle with some very interesting results. As you can see here um, in the Gola Craton, which is a cratonic part of, of Precambrian, Australia, and you know, not far from where I'm sitting, I'm sitting right here in Adelaide. You see the entire mantle is lit up and that's a really interesting result at the time because you know we were expecting perhaps that you know Archean Proterozoic lithosphere. Um, you know, it's resistive, but it shows the exact opposite. And, and I saw really the interesting comment from Paul Pajorgian a few um, uh, weeks back where he said that, you know, you obviously see the similar structures in North America where protozoic um, overprinting introduces uh, metasomatism that, you know, was highlighted by some of these conductors. But really what gave a very strong argument of expanding MT and, you know, really going on a much larger scale is the absolutely stunning results um, that Graham Heinzen produced over the years um, across this profile here. We are in South Australia. Um, this is just on the eastern edge of the Gola Craton that I just um, highlighted. There's a very big um, iron oxide copper gold mine called Olympic Dams, the fourth biggest copper mine in the world and the largest uranium producer in the world. And so over the years, you know, Graham has um, collected more and more MT data across it with these stunning results of, um, you know, cross sections here of that 2D profile where you can see really the entire lower crust and upper mantle is lit up. And then you see these really nice connections up to the surface right where Olympic Dam is, that's OD, and there's two other prospects, Wilderwell and Vulcan, which also have very discrete sort of pathways um, coming up. So when people first saw this, and you know, back in 2006, he had a, um, a much lower resolution image of this, but it was clear that there's something going on in the relation or correlation between low resistivity and the crust. 
and some of the major mineral deposits. And that just really made people think, well, A, what are these conductors? And B, you know, what else we, can we do to find other examples to firm this up? And so this is really how the entire movement gained momentum. And um, Oslem was, came along to kind of build another, you know, backbone data set um, that, you know, was continuously rolled out across the entire continent. And really anyone can buy into it. Um, it's not that we have a central point that does all the data collection. Um, really the, uh, the, the, the bounding parameters are that you collect data in a half degree grid. Um, so roughly every 50 kilometers. And you know, whoever has funding can really um, just go out and, and do this sort of um, survey, but it's obviously uh, very much driven by Geoscience Australia as our federal um, geological survey and some state geological surveys are also putting in money. Um, we obviously in South Australia um, have been pushing this very hard from the beginning, but similarly, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and you know, Northern Territory, this sort of survey is being rolled out. And you can see here that so far, you know, this is a rough number, but six to $7 million have already spent um, by state federal surveys and also OSCOPE, uh, which is a national infrastructure um, institution. And the instrument funding is also coming through OSCOPE um, just to supply uh, the gear in order to um, do these sort of deployments. And Geoscience Australia has its own um, instrument pooled as well. So we now have, I believe over 70 or so uh, long period instruments that are you know, available for this type of survey. Um, there's also some university funding is not quite as large, but um, they can uh, deploy relatively cheaply um, in the particular University of Adelaide um, around Graham Heinzen's group and University of Tain, uh, Tasmania um, have been involved. And we all rely more or less on the computing time on the NCI, which is our national computing um, infrastructure. Some people use their own um, supercomputers that are available within the States, but this is sort of the main one that, that we are using. The goals of OSLAM, again, you know, coming back on some of these early examples of these 2B profiles, it's obviously to understand the geological and tectonic history of the Australian continent. And very importantly, it's to identify the footprints of these mineral and energy systems at, at really all scales. So this is the entire lithospheric scale. And obviously with this type of deployment, you will not be able to see the deposit directly, but the understanding here is, or how can we um, get the understanding of the footprint, the entire lithospheric uh, footprint of these deposits. And it's obviously also a backbone EM data set, as I mentioned before. So upon which you can build uh, for further scale reduction surveys using broadband MT, airborne EM, and I'll show some examples at the end of that. I'm not gonna talk too much about it today, but there have been some studies um, in terms of uh, GICs, um, so geomagnetically induced currents, um, and just their, their hazard towards the electricity infrastructure of Australia, um, especially Li Jung Wang from um, Geoscience Australia has been involved quite a bit in that where the OSLAMP models, um, just very similar to what we've seen from the US array are very helpful in determining that. So let me jump in. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see the actual current state of uh, the OSLAMP deployments. I've taken this from the GA website. Um, the red, you know, these color colored and the green ones are sites that are deployed or currently um, in the ground. Um, the northern ones here are all collected by Geoscience Australia Exploring for the Future program, which was a $100 million program, which just is starting now into its second phase. So this will be continued to roll out across the continent. Uh, much of South Australia has been collected by us, the Geological Survey, in conjunction with um, University of Adelaide and OSCOPE has put in some money as well as GA um, and New South Wales was funded um, by the New South Wales Geological Survey, NGA. Um, so the, the coverage is already um, very remarkable with, I think we're now we are about, you know, a third of the continent. So about 2,200 sites have been deployed. And I just want to highlight the correlation to the um, geology of Australia, really the fundamentally for those that are overseas, um, the central and western part is really Precambrian Australia and the Younging as you go to the east of Phanerozoic and Nelson Kirby, I show that um, some really spectacular results here from the Tasmanites, which is the Phanerozoic. Kate Robinson looked at the transition from the Proterozoic to Phanerozoic, and we've got some really nice examples from the Gola Craton and also up north where we're more in the uh, Precambrian. And 
in terms of instrumentation, uh, we are using Lemmy flux gates or Lemmy instruments um, that are part of the OSCOP National Instrument Pool, which are you know, run and maintained by really the legend of um, Australian uh, MT, Goran Boran, who is just one of those really fundamental people who um, keep things together. And Geoscience Australia has Darren Key who, and Jing Ming, um, who are doing a similar job of um, just kind of providing the instrumentation in order to do that. So we're collecting five channel MT data, just um, standard really, two electric and three magnetic field components. And uh, we record a 10 hertz sampling in the field and that gets reduced to one hertz sampling um, then for processing. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, community engagement and land access. It's a big challenge perhaps in Australia um, in some ways because a lot of the land is you know, belonging to different people. These are um, traditional owners um, so Aboriginal freehold lands, for example, here in South Australia, I just show that as an example, there are large um, areas that um, is under their claim or belongs to them. And also goes to the freehold, there's national parks. So negotiations for land access is quite cumbersome, but it's also very rewarding in a sense because of the community engagement that you get. Um, and, you know, we've been very fortunate to hear some of the Dreamtime stories from the traditional owners um, for some of these areas. And it's been really enlightening, actually. So usually what um, we do um, in South Australia, and I think GA has a very similar approach, is that, you know, you deploy 25 long period MT units per field trip. So field trips are about a week and a half, um, which are deployed usually by car or helicopter in order to do the regular grid. In some of these really remote areas, there are just no roads. So you have to really basically helicopter in. Um, and this is just some of the impressions out in the field. Um, so you, a lot of it is really covered in, in sand. So there's hardly any air crops, very unlike um, what you might see in Canada. So you really need some of the more longer period or MT instrumentation to really see through the cover. And that is the big challenge in Australia. So I've highlighted before that the engagement with the um, landholders is very rewarding. And, you know, there's a lot of learning in terms of the communication, the scientific communication, the jargon that comes from us, perhaps, and some of the dream time stories that are shared by the traditional um, landholders. So it's, it's been wonderful um, to be able to do that. And it's also, you build lasting uh, relationships. And we see that now we, uh, when we roll out the OS array, which is the seismic tomography equivalent um, of that, you know, you can go back and use these relationships that you have built before in order to access the land and, you know, keep on these relationships. So in terms of processing, we leave out the instruments for about a month. And um, I've just done this example a couple of years back when we got the first instruments back. Um, just to kind of show you, you know, more than 10 years ago, we used to do four day recordings um, just for logistical reasons when we had less instruments. And you can just clearly see the improvement in data. So we regularly now get data between about eight and you know, 10, 20,000 seconds, um, especially in remote Australia, there's hardly any noise. So we're getting very high quality data uh, that we can use. So you see a pound resistivity in phases here and then the tipper uh, down there. So it's actually wonderful data to work with. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of the data now, not for um, all of the 1,200 sites, but this is something that Kate Robertson put together um, a couple of years ago, just across some data that was available across Victoria and South Australia. And these are, again, this Parkinson induction arrows that are pointing towards conductors. Um, and the length of the arrow is a, a representation of the strength of the connectivity contrast, so the higher the contrast, the longer the arrow. And you see these remarkable images, even if you don't know anything about the geology, um, but these sort of pin cushion uh, type patterns where, you know, here we have the Gola Craton, again, where the arrows are pointing from a resistor out to a sort of a conductive margin. You can just trace it out from these induction arrows. Similar here, the Musgrave province where we have more acrop, you know, going out towards the um, connective basins. And then some more variations down here um, in the more Phanerozoic regions of um, southeastern Australia. And similarly, you can do the same exercise using face tensors. And again, it's the same uh, kind of pattern that emerges very hard polarized um, or a strong current channeling where you have some of the very large uh, fault zones that are bounding some of the cratonic areas. 
and the same here where you know really nicely bound um, the outcropping area of the Musgrave province for example. So what do you get in terms of um, actual resistivity structure? What I'm showing here is the 3D model that Li Zhong Wang produced in 2014 uh, that is based on just the AWAX GDS data. So the tip of data that was collected roughly every 300 kilometers. And if you overprint um, some of the OSLAM data, and again, I'm not showing everything, but just to give you an idea of what we've done in South Australia and also in Tasmania by Tom Osterson here, this is the type of um, uh, increase in resolution that you get from the OSLAM deployment. So this is obviously constrained by roughly 50 kilometer side spacing. And you're starting to see really these large scale um, linear trends in the crust where the lower crustal conductors appear. And it really is um, a remarkable uh, increase in resolution on, but still on a continental scale from the GDS data if I go back and forth between them. So this is some of the um, you know, really eye-opening images that are coming, starting to come out. Um, in terms of modeling of the OSLAM data, so I said before, we're using the national, um, uh, the NCI in Canberra to do a lot of it. Uh, Kate did some fantastic work um, just recently in testing the wide range of modeling parameters, just to give us a really good understanding of, you know, given the, the deployments that we have and you know, the site spacing is, is always gonna be fairly similar you know, what are some of the parameters and what are really the key um, parameters you need to change and what are the sensitivities to them, especially around model covariances in relation to cell sizes, starting half spaces and a priori information. And I'm just gonna show one example and you can read more about in her paper, but you know, this is the influence of model covariance on the inversion results. So we have all seen this before, but this sort of spectral behavior, some, um, you know, near surface features here that is due to the um, covariances. And then also what I found really interesting at sort of the 172 kilometer step slide, this is just at the kind of margin where you're starting to lose some of the sensitivities in some areas. But this is just uh, giving you some idea of what the effect is of changing the cell size from five kilometers to 10 kilometers in your model, and then also changing around the covariances and how that can really um, amplify some of the features to a point where they just don't really, um, they're not really real anymore. Um, so, but it's important to, to test the range of parameters to um, get to a re really reasonable and geologically meaningful results, um, which is done now, um, obviously by all the MT predictioners across um, OSLAMP. And similar here, you know, the RMS uh, distribution is also very interesting in terms of um, seeing what a good starting model is and how the sensitivities change um, in, inside the model. So Kate um, is also the one who has the badge of doing actually the first 3D inversion of a deployment that was following the OSLAM um, specifications. So, you know, stations roughly every 50 or in her case, sometimes 40 kilometers across the Proterozoic Phenozoic transition. So we are here, uh, I am right now in Adelaide. Um, this is the Flinders Ranges, which is undergoing neo tectonic uplifting. Um, but the transition from Precambrian Australia here in the Gola Crater and to more Phanerozoic um, areas here, the Stellarian origin here. Um, so this is more than around about 500 million years and younger as you go further towards the east. And she identified that even in the Kornamona province, which is also Precambrian, you get again some very remarkable uh, mid to lower crustal conductors, and some of the conductors that are following. Um, some of the elevation here in the Necro arc is also correlated uh, quite nicely with locations of diamond deposits, which are shown here in yellow. So these are very deep seated diamonds are coming from um, the, uh, very much the lower mantle, but it seems like they are using some of the weaker um, rheology and pathways to punch food through the surface. And uh, that can also be seen in in the MT model. So you're starting to see some nice correlation here between some of the conductors and uh, uh, location of some of the mineral systems. So I'm gonna start going around from uh, South Australia up north where um, GA has done a lot of work and come back through Southeastern Australia, Australia back to the Gola Craton, just to show you some of the research highlights um, that we've been able um, to get using this. Um, another study here is in the Musgrave province. Again, this is also an intraplate deformation area. So we are in 
Precambrian um, Australia mostly, but this is at the intersection between or the triple junction between the Western Australian, South Australian, Northern Australian cratons. And it's an area of um, repeated deformation, interplate deformation, um, you know, sometime between two or 300 million years ago and 400 million years ago. Um, and it has some remarkable um, offsets in, in gravity, uh, which are some of the largest in the world. And there's also a potential for nickel copper um, type potential. And uh, there's a Nabel Babel deposit, which sits just about there. And some of the images we're getting, I'm just showing uh, this lower crustal slices again, as we're seeing these sort of east west trending connectivity features. And they also quite nicely line up with where, and the shading here is to gravity um, with the east west trending shading, uh, east west trending gravity that you know, shows you some of the moho uplift. Um, that is due to the interplate deformation. And you can see that here on the right hand side, I'm showing you know, the high gravity highest, which has been modeled as a moho uplift. And again, this correlates really quite nicely with some of the um, lower crustal conductors that we're seeing. So really you are seeing an imprint of interplate deformation within the Australian continent or a buckling of the Australian plate. As we move further north, um, we've got some very um, remarkable results that Jingming Duan has um, produced. So this is an area where um, GA has um, spent a lot of time and money as part of the Exploring for the Future program uh, to collect OSLAM data. Again, this area has um, mineral potential. There's the Mount Isa um, ICG deposit here, uh, which has been well known as the Carpentaria connectivity anomaly, and it comes out really well in these images. Again, here as a conductor, a lower cluster conductor, and there's also Ernest Henry uh, ICG prospect or mine um, that also has a, you know, upper cluster expression, which I'm not showing here, but you can uh, read about it. But there's a large area of basins um, in between these areas, and what GA has been able to show is that some of these conductors do extend underneath these basins and has prompted them to do further um, scale reduction or infill surveys um, across it and really just to open the mineral potential of the region and to, um, to kind of see where those pathways are coming up to the surface. I'm now gonna move, start coming back down to the Southeast. So this is for fairly young terrain. Um, and this is some of the results that Alison Kirby from Geoscience Australia has produced. And these are really stunning images. Um, so this is a model of the Tasmanites in uh, southeastern Australia. This is an area which um, has seen recently uh, establishment of an orocline model that um, progressed in the Silurian, so about 400 million years ago. And it's been shown more from geodynamic modeling point of view by Louis Moresi and uh, Ross Cayley from the Victorian Geological Survey. It's been shown just from uh, surface geology that orocline or rotation um, around a protozoic seven block, which you know came into a subduction system, and then you had an entire slab rollback that just kind of came around uh, in an orocline of fashion. And you see this really remarkable, even for example, in the TMI, these sort of um, you know circular features across southeastern Australia. And this is some of the geology seen here um, uh, that are that are very striking and. Alison has some amazing results where you can see these um, features coming up again in the MT. So she's got these sort of very semi circular uh, connectivity anomalies. And again, you know, what we see a really nice crustal conductors or lower crustal conductors aligned with potential feed data is what we see in the Musgrave province as well. Uh, I have, haven't shown here the seismic anisotropy, but it also shows a nice sort of curvature around uh, that follows a similar trend. And she's been also to demonstrate a very nice correlation with Ordovician arc magmatism and mafic volcanism, as you can see um, up in this image here, where a lot of it seems to be focused where we have these lower crustal conductors. This image um, from a mineral systems point of view shows the um, gold deposits. Um, and again, there's a quite good correlation between some of the uh, margins of the conductors and where those gold deposits sit. Um, so statistically a significant correlation between them. They're not just completely random. Um, and I think Paul Pedrosium actually showed some of those um, images. So I'm not going to repeat it here, but the correlation is very striking. Um, and has led to some of more questions about the genetic link between them. I think Graham Heinz is actually working on this right now as well. 
Um, there's also a very nice, as you go deeper into the mantle, a very nice correlation between very recent volcanism along one of the longest hotspot tracks that um, the Cosgrove hotspot track, which you can see here. So the volcanism is these triangles there. And again, you see a very nice correlation with A, um, LAB to, uh, topography. In a way, you have shallower LAB in these areas. You see these volcanoes poking through. And similarly in the MT, you also see that in the mantle conductors at about a similar depth, there seems to be a correlation again for these higher conductivity anomalies associated with where you had some of the metasomatized uh, mantle really that is um, maybe driving some of the volcanism. So I'm gonna come back now to the Gola Craton and uh, show you some of the examples that we have here on our doorstep. So this is kind of closing the loop a bit with um, the spectacular image that Graham Heinzen has produced over the years across Olympic Dam. So here, as I mentioned before, we have the sort of Gola Craton uh, Archean Proterozoic, which is sort of semicircular shape of the um, total magnetic intensity here, the gravity. We see the margins and some of the bigger fault zones um, surrounding the Gola Craton. Um, and this is the equivalent MT image, uh, resistivity depth life of about 30 kilometers. As you can see here, there's a, again a, a remarkable correlation of lower crustal conductors, you know, really hugging around the, the margins of the Gola Craton. You might remember the induction error image that I showed before that Kate Robertson produced, where the induction errors were all pointing out uh, towards the edges of, of those conductors. So the story here is that the Olympic Dam being an iron oxide copper gold deposit, this type of deposits the genesis of them was not really quite well understood um, even a few years back, um, but we're starting to emerge a picture of that these are really require a whole of lithosphere approach to understanding uh, their genesis. So what I'm showing here on the left is a resistivity image at again, the mantle depths about 150 kilometers where in the Gola Craton, um, you still was expected to be a solid mantle but you see that the resistivities are, are very, very low um, at this sort of depth and the locations of some of the major IOCG, IOCG deposits are shown here. And what we correlate these matter conductors is with really uh, metasomatic processes that happened during the Proterozoic and specifically around 1.6 billion years ago that really metasomatized and um, you know, led to a fertilization of the bottom of the lithosphere uh, of the Gola Craton, which, you know, in large parts is, is Archean. And, you know, this very likely introduced these sort of conductors within the mantle. What we also see is you're obviously trying to understand what these conductors are and, you know, typical discussions range from sulfides, graphite, um, minor, other minor conducting phases. We have an interesting example here in South Australia where we know that the geometries that we also see in the crust are correlated with um, a lot of the rocks that were in place 1.6 billion years ago. And that's also the age of the emplacement of these major IOCG deposits. Um, and all of these rocks, uh, the Hilton Pacific Granite where the deposits are sitting in and the um, Gola Range Volcanics, which is a large uh, volcanic field across the area that um, we have really enhanced values of fluorine in all of them. Now, fluorine is quite interesting in the sense that recent laboratory studies um, have shown that fluorine within flogopite can really reduce your um, electrical resistivity. So it's an interesting postulation that the conductor here could also be caused by a flogopite, especially since the metal of conductor starts at about you know, 80 to 100 kilometers depth and then extends further down. Um, it's not really visible in the upper mantle, but it only starts around about this sort of depth, which from seismic tomography, we know quite often uh, correlates to the mid lithospheric discontinuity. As we go up from the mantle into the crust, again, really remarkable correlations. I'm showing here again, the resistivity depth slice of the lower crust um, at 30 kilometers. And superimposed on top are some of the copper occurrences um, and the contained resources. So the main ones here is Olympic Dam, which is really the, the massive super giant that across the entire area. We have other ones like Carapatina, et cetera. So this is the Stewart Shelf area, very prospective. We have some other copper deposits, also sedimentary copper across this area. Again, the correlation is really quite remarkable and I will show a cross section across it from west to east um, across this entire area to kind of show you what it looks like across the entire lithospheric scale of that system. 
And this all feeds into the mineral system concept. So, you know, we have the ore deposit site itself, but what we really after is the fluid pathway with some of the, you know, heat driving the fluids and metals and magma coming up to the surface and leading to the ultimate emplacement. And this also ties in this some of the idea that um, some of these magmatic ore deposits, you know, have continental root control. And I just really want to look at you at this image, even though this is for, you know, drawn for nickel copper uh, PGE deposits, it is basically the same for ISCG deposits where you have a metasomatized or fertilized bottom of the um, subcontinental lithosphere mantle that's been metasomatized and then you get another kick like a thermodynamic trigger that then leads to partial melting which then transports it up to the surface. So if you have this image in mind, and then I'm showing here the cross section, um, this is you know almost a thousand kilometers long down to 300 kilometers depth. This is a cross section directly out of the 3D MT model. You see the resistive uh, central gall or craton, you know, that goes down from the LAB depth. We know this is about 180, 200, 220 kilometers depth. It's very resistive. There are some conductors in the, uh, in the upper crust, but really the remarkable, um, really entire lithospheric footprint of, of perhaps this mineral system is that you see this metasomatized mantle um, here during the Proterozoic and it does come up to the surface along the margin of the Gola Craton up into the ICG deposit uh, province where you have Olympic Dam, Carpatina and a lot of the other ICG um, deposits in themselves. So just across the entire area, um, this is really I think a prime example for um, seeing the entire lithospheric footprint and why, you know, going out uh, across an entire array um, is so important in order to understand these systems. That's a bit of eye candy for you. Um, this is just some depth slices and 3D models using ISO surfaces of this model again. And you can see again, here we are in South Australia and the blue colors are high resistivity of the Gola Craton. Um, and you see that coming up to the surface along the margin of the Gola Craton here. And then in a minute, I will um, turn on <clears throat> some of the ISO surface associated with it. I should also point out the area that Kate Robertson worked in is here, the Konomona province, where we see again, mid to lower crustal conductors that I actually seem to be related somehow in this area. Um, one idea is that this drifted away from the Gola Craton or was more linked in the past, drifted away and maybe has um, produced some of those pathways coming up to the surface. But using these isosurfs, you see now um, this sort of boundary across the Gola Craton itself in the crust here. What also comes out really nicely is this mantle conductor, which is this feature down here. Um, starting at depths of around about 100 kilometers and then extending further down. <clears throat> and you see that it's more genetically linked to the um, Konamona province. Um, and one also really nice is here, the uh, Peninsula Connectivity Anomaly uh, that we've worked on over the years. And um, this is really driven by graphite, um, also in place roughly around about 1.7, 1.8 billion years. Um, and Anthony White, you know, he had a nature paper on this back in 1984. Um, so again, this comes out very, very strongly in the um, OSLAM model. And <clears throat> what I'm doing now here in this image is to turn on the more resistive areas, which will again point out the more perhaps unaltered uh, cratonic areas. You know, this is the central Gaula craton. So we're now highlighting the areas that are, you know, maybe void of or have been stripped of um, any fertilization. And you see that the mantle for some parts of Gola Craton is very resistive, whereas these parts here are the imprints of the metasomatism during the um, Proterozoic that then impinges upon the otherwise resistive um, Archean part of the Craton. That's a really nice, I guess, visualization of, um, well, the, you know, the tectonic history, but also it leads to the um, iron oxide copper gold belt, so Olympic dam around this area here. And in the next few slides, I will point out um, just one example of these slow scale reduction uh, surveys that we are doing. Because um, the whole idea here is to really, you know, use this as a background and then you do your scale reduction broadband MT surveys to some of those prospective areas that are highlighted by lower across the conductors to understand, you know, really where are some of those um, pathways that you know Graham has shown so spectacularly over the years and can we see them in other areas <clears throat> so 
Um, in the previous picture, I showed you where Olympic Dam is, and just south from there, there were other deposits such as Carapatina, and we have collected in the last few years as part in within the geological survey over 300 broadband MT sites across this area. And I'm just going to show two profiles um, across this um, entire area. Some of the data again looks quite spectacular. This is plotted across uh, some of the mag magnetic anomalies and you can see the face sensors here really nicely aligning with some of the dikes that are cutting through the area and some of the major fault zones that runs around um, here where you have a very different response of the uh, face sensors in the northeastern part as opposed to the southern part. That's just the data. I'm going to show you in a, a result of a MT profile that crosses Oak Dam, which is a recent discovery by um, BHP. Um, Oak Dam is about 50 kilometers south of um, uh, Olympic Dam. And then we have other prospects here, Pantil, Maslin, and this is again plotted on gravity. It's very interesting to see again that even um, gradients in the gravity seem to have some control of where you find some of the prospects and uh, mineral deposits across this area. This is the southern one uh, where I've rotated the image a little bit. Um, two prospects, again, really nicely constrained with some of the very narrow pathways. And this is an image that goes down to the lower crust, 35 kilometers. We see sort of crustal conductors um, punching up through the surface, very similar to what we've seen with Olympic Dam. And the other example is here, Oak Dam West um, that BHP discovered. Again, a similar thing where we seem to have lower crustal conductors and there's a mechanical boundary at the brittle ductile zone where the, you then get sort of breakthrough and coming up fluids to the surface in more discrete pathways. And it really de depends on your site spacing of how well you resolve them. Uh, but we found, you know, one kilometer space data is very good um, at pinpointing some of those. And we also managed to collect some airborne EM. And this is again, just highlighting you, you know, really the scale reduction, you can drive that all the way up to the surface almost. These are some flight lines of AEM data um, at roughly every three kilometers and one and a half kilometers across uh, Carapatina, where these only go down to about 200 meters. So a lot of it is, um, you know, giving you an expression of the sedimentary strata, which is really driving the connectivity here, but even on a very kind of near surface scale, the conductors are seem to be correlating to some of the gradients that you see in the data, which is probably a reflection of deeper seated, you know, upper um, upper, ba upper crustal basement structures. So I might wrap up here um, just to, uh, you know, for keeping to time. I just want to highlight again that, you know, OSLAM is publicly available on peer data, M data that usually gets delivered through web portals of state and uh, federal geological surveys. And it's really been leaps and bounds in terms of um, driving our understanding of the mineral systems of the Australian continent, especially that from that very regional or continental scale up into the kind of CAM scale, that that then transition is where MT is really has been trying to be really powerful and to help us understand the mineral system across all scales. And um, there's also some really nice examples of the geodynamic framework of past and present tectonism. And I um, haven't shown this here, but Space Weather Hazard, Hazard is also an ongoing research that's been uh, coming especially out of Geoscience Australia. And I also want to mention that OSLAM has been really wonderful in terms of growing our EM community in Australia. There's been more and more people, especially within geological surveys, that have found work as MT specialists. And there's really strong collaboration between um, academia and geological surveys in that sense. Um, and has really grown the use of MT and there's also led on to um, uptake by industry of MT um, to really find a fine scaled surveys across their tenements uh, for direct mineral um, exploration targeting. Um, so it's been wonderful actually to be part of it uh, and you know to really see this community grown over the last 15 years that I've been in Australia, you know from humble beginnings where we had five instruments to now um, you know over 100 instruments uh, in total. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. I want to finish by acknowledgements, and I'm really sorry if I uh, have left someone out, but this is just running through some of the names that, um, you know, could have equally given the talk or have been uh, very much involved in producing some of those very stunning results um, that we've seen across Australia. So I might actually leave it there. Um, and thanks for your time and, you know, being able to share these really nice results of, of OSLAM across Australia. So thanks very much. Oh.
clapping on behalf of everybody who's listening, Stefan. Thank you. That's absolutely spectacular talk. And so we um, open it up to questions now. And um, what I'd like to do when questions appear, I'll read them out so that they get into the uh, into the record. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment. So I think you've blown everybody away, Stefan. You you. You've got 15 more minutes. <laughs> you could present That's some fine. more work. <laughs> yep. uh, Chris yep. Nin of, uh, of Canada asks, what is the schedule for future coverage? Yep, um, a very good question. So <clears throat> as maybe as opposed to the US array, there's no uh, central point that drives the acquisition. So it's really a funding availability that, that drives how um, the acquisition is happening and thankfully uh, Geoscience Australia is now embarking on Exploring for the Future 2, which is um, covering more of Southern Australia. Um, and I think they will collect more OSLAM data in areas that are deemed to be a deep dive area. So there are a particular focus for, you know, mineral systems reasons, etc. But they also would like to build a backbone actually two by two degree grid, which is a little bit different to um, to Auslam, um, but it will focus mostly on Southern Australia and then really anyone who has interest in uh, deploying the Auslam grid or can put up money for it and sees the value, um, you know, this is then how it, how it continues to drive further. Um, we in South Australia, we already finished, otherwise we will keep investing in it. Um, but I think this is how, how Auslam really grows, um, but it goes alongside scale reduction surveys. Um, so there's always a trade-off between where some of the funding goes. Uh, Stuart Fishwick, uh, it's wonderful to have a, a seismologist listening in where maybe they'll, you know, they'll learn something. <laughs> Sorry, Stuart. Thanks for the talk, says Stuart. Do you think that the conductors are actually proterozoic or in age? Or is there some sort of continuous fertilization or other process of these zones that were formed way back when and continues through geological time. Now that's, yep, that's a, a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. And um, that's something I always uh, don't quite answer during the talk. My answer is that I think the first, perhaps the first point of weakness was created in a um, protozoic, but we have multiple instances where we know that the um, fertilization happened even after that. So I think once your, your lithosphere is weak, it's always prone to um, refertilization just because some of the um, geodynamic or the deformation happens in these areas. So it's very likely um, that a lot of these areas are uh, continuously refertilized um, and always deformed over time. So for example, some of the conductors in the Flinders Ranges I would argue um, some of them are actually still seeing deformation today and some of the conductors could well be driven by actual fluids that are still sort of kicking around the crust right now. Just because we know there's um, continuous uplift in the last 5 million years, for example, even though the rocks themselves are protozoic. So you kind of have to see at really the geological record and I haven't uh, talked a lot about this in this talk, but we constantly look at isotope data what they can tell us in terms of when deformation happened. So the answer is most of the time uh, it continuously fertilizes. Some of the time it's only in a protozoic. That's where you have to look at the geological record and the isotopes. Yeah, I, I had the same issue in uh, the slave craton where we have this anomaly that could either be Archean or could be uh, Eocene in age you know, related to kimberlite, modern kimberlite magnetism or, or related to formation of the slave craton. And I think probably the answer is both. As you yep. said, that the, you know, you get these pathways created during formation and, and those, those are used during later um, uh, fluid flow. So Walter Garrido asks, uh, thanks for the presentation. I noticed the resistivity models got very low values, less than three meters. What kind of geological units could be associated with those values? Yep, um, maybe I wouldn't quite answer that in terms of geological unit. Um, MT is very 
sensitive to minor conducting phases that quite often drive the main reduction in resistivity. So it's not necessarily the unit itself, but it's the minor conducting phase. And that can be anything from active fluids. Um, graphite is, is, is really remarkable in reducing conductivity. And you know, um, I think Graham Heinzen has is, is just got a paper in review right now where he looks at that air peninsula anomaly um, that are highlighted in South Australia, which in a cross has remarkably low electrical um, resistivity. Um, and we know that there are graphite deposits. Um, the other ones are sulfide, et cetera. So we have to kind of look at lab measurements on, in order to explain some of the very low um, conductivity values. So I wouldn't necessarily point to a geological unit in that case, but it's trying to understand what um, minor conducting phase is really driving it um, mm -hmm. is how I would answer it. Yeah, if I could just jump in and and ask a question about the fluorine, uh, because the um, many years ago Dave Berner was proposing that flogopite was important for conductivity <clears throat> in the mantle. But when I talk to uh, people who look at xenoliths, they tell me that flogopite is never connected; it's always in, in separate minerals. And so I guess what's important then is the diffusion rate of the fluorine itself. And I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, something I prepared earlier. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think it's going to take too long to really go into it, but uh, there's a quite a nice paper by Lee et al. 2016, where you can re -up, read up on some of the diffusion rates. And I think it's, it's quite remarkable how high it is. I mean, I, I totally take your point on board about uh, connectivity, etc. Um, and the question is still out there of how much flogopite there is, but there are some ideas that, that especially around the mid spheric discontinuity, that flogopite could play a factor there. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the jury is still out um, and you have to kind of, for that sort of question, look more at the lab measurements to try and help you really, you know, what type, what kind of um, resistivity can you possibly get? Um, but the diffusion rates are quite large as far as I understood from the paper. So, Abba uh, Deramchi, and I'm terribly sorry for mispronouncing that, Abba uh, Thanks for the awesome presentation. How could you be sure of interpreting some mineralizations and comparing them, for instance, to rich uh, iron magnesium basic, ultra basic rocks? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Um, is, is the question around tying the mineralization to uh, rich iron magnesium ultra basic rocks or um, I, I don't quite understand? Yeah, no, I, uh, sorry, Abuka. could you rephrase your question, please? And um, just so we can try and understand it uh, a little more. I mean, I'm not sure if I, if I compared them to the uh, ultra basic rocks themselves. Uh, maybe maybe this points towards um, the work that Alison Kirby has done. So all I was trying to do there, which is what they talked about in the paper, is just to um, look at the correlation between gold mineralization in one instance and then some of the volcanism that happened is, but I'm not sure if that's where the question goes. So I don't really know how to answer it. Okay, I think then if we've no more questions um, for, for Stefan, we'll let him go and I'll, I'll clap on behalf of everybody else again. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for absolutely wonderful seminar. You're, you're really uh, showing the way, Australians are showing the way and how MT needs to be done. But I guess you're very lucky that A, you've got this regolith, so geophysics is absolutely needed in Australia. And, and B, you don't have so much cultural noise. It's, 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 it's wonderful. I would it's not want to um, deal with that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and again, yeah. you know, I'll just, I, I want to highlight, um, just the wonderful community you have in, you know, again, the quite range of 
people that could have given the talk. Um, and it's yeah, it's been a real joy over the years um, to have that community available and not be the sole the sole survivor, I guess. So it's been really good. Okay, so I'll just take your screen back and uh, remind everybody that uh, the seminar next week is uh, is two hours earlier, and um, it's a, a software one. Alison Kirkby is going to tell us about MTPy, and um, I actually downloaded MTPy a week ago and installed it on my Mac. A bit of a fight, but I got it done, and uh, very very exciting. Uh, uh, a shell of a program, if you like, that can do all sorts of things and you can plug in your own codes. So see everybody uh, next week. Have a, have a great, uh, have a great week. Stay safe and uh, see you in a week's time. Bye. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you.